There you go, Linda, you are good to go. Okay, thanks, Dana. All right, I'll start over. Um, so hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today and welcome to our Women in Leadership Career Development Webinar on Building Resilience in the Face of Adversity, hosted by the Women in Leadership Montreal Chapter. My name is Linda Mota and I am the chair for Will Montreal. I am a leadership coach and the CEO of a human resources consulting firm in Montreal. This session is all about how two incredible women who have faced both personal and professional challenges have been able not only to overcome these challenges, uh, but become more resilient in the process and are now thriving in their careers. Through Will, I've met some incredible women who inspire me by sharing their knowledge, experiences, and career journeys so openly with the Will community. And today I'm very excited to present our two amazing panelists, Christina Caddis and Beth Christian. Christina, Christina Caddis is a notary and founder of a law firm located in the West Island of Montreal, specialized in capacity procedures, estate planning, estate settlement, marriage celebrations, and real estate. Maid Caddis obtained her licensate in law with distinction from the University of Ottawa. She then completed a degree in taxation at the University of Sherbrooke and a notarial law degree from the University of Montreal. Christina is also the co-founder of the Lena Fund, a charity benefiting the hematology and oncology division of the Montreal Children's Hospital. She's an advocate for childhood cancer awareness and preparing for the unexpected. Maid Caddis is a wife and mother to a little girl named Lena. She loves to travel with her family and has a passion for interior design and decor. Our next panelist is Beth. Beth serves as the deputy Secretary, sorry, Deputy Sec Secretary for Administration in the Department of General Services. In this capacity, she serves as the Chief Operating Officer for over 960 employees in Pennsylvania's primary agency for general services, including human resources, budget, risk and insurance management, information technology, print and media services, and real estate transactions for the Commonwealth. Most recently, Beth has served in DGS for 10 years as director of the Bureau of Real Estate, where she oversaw property and acquisitions, leasing and space design for the state. She also incorporated her 25 plus years of boots on the ground experience in administration, contracting and real estate with her vision to create a world-class real estate service organization. She previously served in a leadership capacity in the Department of Human Services and began her Commonwealth career in the Department of Labor and Industry. Beth serves on the board of the STEM Up Network Advisory Board, a group encouraging more women to enter STEM careers, Society for Human Resource Management, National Association of Facility Administrators, currently serving on the board of directors, diversity and inclusion professionals of Central PA, and a volunteer in NICU Cuddler, and shares her passion for public service as a mentor in the Commonwealth's mentee program, mentor mentee program. So these are our panelists. I'm super excited to have them with us today. Lena, if you can just change slides. So we will start with a land acknowledgement. Montreal is historically known as a gathering place for many First Nations. Today, it is a home to a diverse population of Indigenous and other people. We respect the continued connections with the past, present, and future in our ongoing relationships with Indigenous and other people within the Montreal community. Next slide, please. So thank you again for joining us. Before we start, we'd like you to use the Q&A for questions. This presentation is being recorded and uploaded to our website following this event. Next slide. So we just did our intro. Perfect. So we'll begin with some of our questions. Um, Lena, if you could just go back to the very first slide. We'll leave it at the first, first slide. So I'll start with Christina. So Christina, tell us about your career trajectory. What is the biggest factor that's contributed to your career success? Okay, so um, right when I finished law school, I uh, immediately opened my own practice and I've actually had my own practice for almost a decade now. And I would say that for me, um, the biggest things that's contributed to my success has been the team that I've built over the years and also the network that I've created. Um, so 
I have a wonderful team of um, paralegals that assist me every day that take wonderful care of my clients along with me and that share the values that I have within my business. So that I think having a team being well surrounded by a team that um, shares your views and handles your files and your clients in the best possible way um, definitely contributes to success. And then the network, um, the people that I've met along the way, the um, different professionals that I work with, the different clients that I work with, the referrals that that's come with. So um, the best um, business for me is when a client refers you to someone else. So I think that that's definitely been um, the key to my success. Amazing. And Beth, can you tell us about your career trajectory and what the biggest success factor has been uh, to contribute to your career success? Sure. Thank you for the question. And good morning, or good morning everyone. Um, so I started out my career as a clerical employee. Um, I don't, I did not have a college degree. I do not have a college degree. So I started in the state, um, not thinking I would spend my career there, but it was a steady income and it was a stable job. And um, I worked my way up through to the deputy secretary for administration, which is two steps from the governor, which is, you know, our the head of our state. I know I'm in, I'm in the United States, so it's a little different, uh, but um, it took a lot of hard work, uh, a lot of working extra hours, a lot of giving up time with my kids. Um, but at the end of the day, it was worth it because I've been able to help a lot of people with me and I help a lot of people um, bring them with me. Um, and, you know, the biggest factor that's contributed to my success, I think, is saying yes, saying yes to new opportunities, saying yes to, you know, new work, um, showing up as my best self uh, every time I can, and showing care and love for my employees. You know, no matter what the overall culture is, if I take care of my employees, they're going to get the work done, and they're going to create a really successful environment no matter where I work. So if I am the shield for my employees, Sometimes I'm the shield, sometimes I'm the cheerleader, but that's the best thing that I can be when they need it uh, to be successful. Thank you. Great. Um, Lena, uh, sorry, not Lena, Christina, what challenges have you encountered that have contributed to building your resilience? So I would say that the biggest challenge that I faced um, was actually the illness of my child. So my daughter was actually diagnosed with cancer when she was 21 months old, and she spent two and a half years at the Montreal Children's Hospital uh, undergoing cancer treatments. And I would say that it was definitely during that time that I had to ask myself a lot of very, very tough questions. And I had to really just... I couldn't change the diagnosis, but I was definitely able to change my outlook or my perception of the situation. So during that time, I was still building a practice. Uh, I still had my files. I still had my clients. I still had my office. So it was just to navigate through my daughter's illness and be there for her, spend all my days, all my nights that I could with her to accompany her through all of her treatments. Um, even if that involved having my laptop in a hospital room, I mean, that happened multiple times. Um, but I would say now it's, she finished her treatment. She's doing better. She's much better. And having gone through that, I think there's nothing that scares you anymore. There's nothing that, you know, you feel that you can't face when you've dealt with something so difficult. So definitely you become resilient because you are faced with a situation where you don't know the outcome. You don't know um, what is going to happen. And that's the scariest part. Um, but with the, your outlook, the, people that you're surrounded by, you can definitely get by it and definitely a very strong mindset. I think that was the key in all this. And um, three and a half years later, things are great. So Christina, because I know you on a personal level as well. Yes. Uh, talk to us about the, um, uh, you know, what were you, you going through career wise at that time? Uh, Lena had just been diagnosed, you had, you know, you were think rethinking about your partnership, and maybe wanting to start something on your own. So talk to us a little bit about that. 
So um, essentially, while Lena was sick, I was actually um, going through the end of a business partnership and actually opening another practice on my own. Um, so the scariest part was essentially taking that leap and deciding that I would go ahead and open my own office and not have another notary that I could rely on and, you know, have staff that's going to report to me only and not be able to share that responsibility. So I actually signed a lease, built a place um, and was fully functional uh, while my daughter was sick. So um, after the most intense parts of her treatments, when things were looking up, uh, that's when I decided to actually take that leap of faith. And I went ahead with my uh, project. And it was a huge project, a huge undertaking. COVID had just hit. Uh, I actually built uh, an entire practice, um, the construction part, the actual everything, the new logo, the branding, the team, everything. Um, and then couldn't be happier. <laughs> And her so, office is gorgeous. It looks like it's out of a magazine. A thank, you. <laughs> thank, you. Magazine thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And that, uh, that, you know, the design and keeping up, you know, deciding on paint colors and flooring and all of these different things just really kept me going. And it made me looking forward to something, um, even though I was, you know, going through something very difficult. Thank you for that. Um, Beth, uh, what challenges have you encountered that have contributed to building your resilience in your career? Um, I think, uh, I got to, you know, I was divorced when my kids were one and three. So I became a single mom pretty early in their life. Uh, my son was diagnosed with on the autism spectrum at two and a half. Um, and you know, this was 20 some years ago. So there wasn't as much information and knowledge out there about that. And um, trying to work and build myself up in my career while still going to his appointments and being his advocate was definitely interesting. Um, also, just being insecure, you know, having some insecurities um, about not having a college degree, about being overweight, about all of these things that gave me a bit of imposter you know, syndrome or phenomenon or whatever you want to call it. I think those all, um, you know, contributed to the way that I felt, but I also had really great mentors who showed me that I could be more and I continued to say yes and I continued to work hard. Um, and what I realized was um, something similar to what Christina said, I couldn't control what was happening with my son, but at work, I, I did have control. I could control the success of my work. I can control the success, success of my projects, of my mentees. Um, and I threw myself into that, that um, the thing of being out of control for me was really hard and not being able to kind of help my son in the way that I wish I could, which was to cure him. So, um, which there is no cure, of course. So it was, it was really about um, becoming resilient because I, I learned what to do with all of that energy that I had and I, I put it into my work. And what it also did was it made me extremely empathetic um, to other people and help them learn about resilience. If I tell them my story, uh, where I started, where I ended up, um, and the things that I've been through, um, other people realize they can do the same thing. Um, it, you know, you don't have to, just because you hit a bump or a big bump, uh, it doesn't mean that you have to give up and it doesn't mean you're stuck where you are. Right, right, absolutely. Um, how do you deal with pressure and setbacks, Beth? Um, when I was younger, uh, I used to kind of spin and go down a rabbit hole, you know, whenever I would make a mistake or I would get a setback. Um, especially if somebody would point it out to me. Um, I've become more of an optimist. Um, I've learned that I can learn a lot from a mistake. I can learn a lot from um, a setback. Uh, I used to be the person who said, don't bring me a problem without a solution. Well, I don't believe that anymore because what I realized was my employees weren't bringing me the problems if they didn't have a solution. So now I don't even know what's going on, what's wrong in my own team. Um, and so, you know, I can develop new plans and we can still accomplish the goal. We can do it together. Um, with the pressure, um, I do some volunteer work that really helps me with the pressure. It's, you know, you hold a baby in the NICU and like everything else doesn't even matter. You're like holding a little teeny baby's life or, um, you know, spending time with my granddaughter or just talking to my husband, um, getting a massage, doing all kinds of things like that that kind of handle help me with the pressure. But I've also embraced joy. And so no matter what the setback, no matter what it is, um, 
I've kind of taken to, okay, how do we fix it? I don't want to relive it. I don't want to rehash it. I just want to move forward. How do we fix it? No one's in trouble. Let's go. Exactly. Very good. Christina, how do you deal with pressure and setbacks? So for pressure, I would say, I think it was coming to the realization that you can do everything by yourself and help learning to delegate, learning that, you know, someone else can do the work very well as well. And you don't have to do every single step. It's okay to delegate certain things so that you end up, you know, getting ahead on your to-do list. Because I was just realizing that some things were just not getting done. Um, so for pressure, really the biggest thing or the biggest growth that I would say is being able to delegate effectively, still being able to lead, still being able to be there to answer their, their questions or to be available for my team, but actually to just let them go on and, you know, learn for themselves and help you along the way. And it's been extremely rewarding. So I think that's taken off quite a bit of pressure, I would say. Um, and in terms of setbacks, I think it's just pausing and taking some time and just rethinking what happened, why it happened, some self-reflection, uh, definitely travel, definitely even just going up north for the weekend, just clearing your head and you completely have a different outlook on the situation um, a couple of hours or a couple of days later, just because sometimes when you're in it, you don't really see the solution or you just, you know, you see the situation that you're faced with. But if you just take a bit of time and say, first of all, it's not that bad after all, I've dealt with worse. And then you have to tell yourself, well, what could I do or how can I do this differently? And how can I be re-energized to actually deal with this? Because sometimes we realize that we're just depleted when we're dealing with it. So, of course, things seem much bigger than they actually are. So I think just to take a little bit of time, you know, to disconnect, whether it's, you know, read a good book, like Beth said, get a massage, just spend some time with your loved ones, laugh, you know, have a dinner with, you know, a friend, someone that makes you feel good. And then you just have a complete fresh outlook when you look at the same issue that you had before. Great. So what energizes you about your work, Christina? For me, what energizes me a lot is that I get to a company, like the work that I do has a very direct impact on people's lives. So I marry couples. I see them in their very joyous moments. I am able to assist families when it comes to incapacity. So I specialize in incapacity procedures. When someone's faced with an illness, very often dementia, Alzheimer's, I'm able to accompany the family through the difficult time. And actually, I can't change the fact that their loved one is ill, but I could make it easier for them to help them. I could make it easier for them to um, you know, support them to help make decisions for them. And I find just seeing that you have that comforting or soothing feeling or that, you know, clients just feel that first of all, they could come to you, that they're comforted by your assistance and that you can maybe not make things okay, but make things better. Um, I think that's like very, very rewarding for me. Um, you know, I'm energized about accompanying them through different things after sometimes it's joyous things it's not only negative so you know the same person that I'm helping deal with the death of a loved one or an incapacity I may also help buy their first property or buy their first revenue property or um, you know do their wills because they're expecting a child or because you know some other life event happened to them so just I'm energized just knowing that, you know, wow, these clients I'm their legal advisor they come to see me for everything and I can like all of these different milestones that they go through in their life, I could go through them with them. So for that, you know, my work energizes me uh, definitely in that sense. What's the greatest professional risk you've taken and how did it turn out? For me or for Beth? For you. <laughs> for me? The greatest risk I've taken, and sometimes I can't even believe that I did, was actually deciding to sign a long-term lease with a child that was sick, not knowing what was going to happen, not knowing what the outcome would be, but saying, you know what, it is what it is. And I will deal with it. This is a great opportunity. This is a beautiful space. I see myself thriving here. And no matter what, I mean, when you look at 
the length of the lease and the cost of the lease, you're in for a couple hundred thousand dollars and you're saying, well, can I do this? Can I not? And what I've realized is, and I feel like a lot of women feel this way because I've had conversations with them is they're less likely to take that risk, even though they're pretty ready. But in many cases, a man would have taken the risk three times earlier than you. So I think that you just have to say, you know what? It is what it is. I'm going to work really hard. I really do believe in myself. I believe in the work that I do. I know that I can do a good job. And I know that no matter what, I can succeed. So I think the biggest risk was opening my firm and actually just, and in one sense, like what I basically learned was, wow, you actually had that confidence or you actually took that risk. Like I'm proud that I actually told myself that I can do it and I didn't stop myself because I find that the person that limits you the most is yourself. Absolutely. So, And do you feel that going forward that's impacted your decision-making process in other areas? Definitely. Definitely. When a new project comes along, I would have been the first one to say, well, you know, what if this project doesn't work? Or, you know, what if we do this and the investment is, you know, quite a few thousand dollars and what if it doesn't work out? But in the end, if you know that it's going to work out, you'll make it work out. Maybe you're going to have to tweak it. Maybe it's not going to work from the get go. Maybe the project that you had in mind is not going to end up being the final result. But at least you have to actually try to put it in place. And more often than not, you're going to surprise yourself at how well it goes. So very, very, very true. Yeah. So, have you drawn professional inspiration or have been mentored by other women? Is that for me? Sorry. I didn't. Okay. Yes. yes um, I've had three significant mentors in my life. Um, one early on in my career uh, when I was a clerical employee who saw something in me and um, just gave me little tidbits of advice here and there, put me in rooms with people that were at higher levels than me that would notice me, see my work ethic, encouraged me not to say, oh, I'm just a clerk or I'm just a this, but to really sell myself. Um, and then I had another mentor about halfway through my career who, again, um, put me in charge of projects that I thought were beyond me, but I was able to accomplish successfully. And my last mentor, um, she is the one who really convinced me to start saying yes. Uh, at that point, people had started to get to know me, know my name, ask me to speak at events, ask me to do things. And I was like, I can't do that. You know, they're going to ask for a biography. What am I going to put on my biography? I don't have college. Everybody starts their biography with, I went to this school and I graduated with this. And um, so she sat down with me and we wrote a biography that was more about my experience and my boots on the ground, you know, and, and my passions. Um, and she convinced me to, you know, get a professional photo taken and do all these things. And I started to say yes. And those three um, mentors all came at the right places in my life. I reach back out to them still to this day. Um, um, and I think that um, they all taught me compassion, compassion for my employees. Um, remembering that people are human, that they don't leave things at the door. Like people say, oh, leave it at the door. That's not true. If somebody's got something going on in their life, like Christina with your daughter, me with my son, um, I had people that said, it's okay, bring it with you. I'll help you carry it and, it, and, and we'll do it together. And those mentors taught me so much compassion about my employees. I think that's why I have so many loyal employees now because they know how much I care about them. One of the things you shared with me a couple of months ago was how you stayed connected with your team during COVID. Can you share that with the, with our community? I would be happy to. Um, so, you know, COVID went into effect March of 2020 and starting in April of 2020, I hand wrote letters to every single person on my staff. I would put little gifts in them. It might be like one of those little sliding camera covers or a mask or a lottery ticket or something. Um, I would just put little something, little goodies in there. And um, what I started to see, number one, was people started to write letters to each other and it kind of became contagious. And although we were meeting on Teams and meeting on Zoom, what I heard from my staff was, all I get in the mail is either junk or bills. And then I get this card from you and it's fun. And you like handwritten the whole card and you've talked to me about something that's important to me. Um, and I did that for a year and a half. 
and I didn't ever stop. I, I never stopped writing them. I made sure I did it every single month and I was consistent. Um, and I can't tell you the impact that it had to my team um, and how much beyond, you know, we had happy hours on Zoom. We did all the things other people did, but those letters, people remembered them. Um, and they knew that, you know, I was taking my own time, my own posted, my own whatever um, to do it. And that it was important to me because I was like, if I'd hear them talking about something on the call, I'd make sure I wrote about it. Um, oh, I heard you say something's going on with your pet. I heard you say something's going on with your husband. Do you want to talk about that? Um, and although at the time it seemed like nothing, you know, it didn't seem like such a big deal to me later, I found out the impact that it was having on other people. And um, so still to this day, I still write my staff letters. I don't do it so as consistently because we see each other more, um, but I still write them notes. I still write them letters and I make sure to call out things that are very specific to them. Um, so that they're not just kind of standard letters and that handwritten, there's something about that handwritten note that just means something. Personal. Mm -hmm. It was definitely personal, right? That personal touch. I know Christina does that in her office with her team too, not the letters, but does a lot of personal things. And I don't know, it just has an impact, right? Yes. When people feel you care, they just, uh, they, they feel more loyal. They feel respected and appreciated, right? Yes. As a female leader, you lead such a large team, 960 employees. Um, you know, what is the best work-related advice you've ever received that's made you the, the, the amazing leader that you are? Huh, let me think. I'm trying to find my answer because I want to make sure I don't forget anything. Um, so hold on, give me a second. What number is that on our, on our questions? Help me. Oh, I'm not sure what number that is. <laughs> okay. If you'd like, we can skip and come back. We'll go to... Oh, go ahead, go ahead. We'll go to, do you recall any biases or assumptions made about you and how did you address them? I, to me, for me? Yes. Yes. I absolutely do. Um, I was talking to some of my employees uh, and they said to me, you know, the custodians, they think you're rich. They think you live in a mansion. Um, they think you have everything because you're in this job. And then the other day they saw you driving your 2011 Ford Escape and they didn't understand. And I was like, cause I'm just a regular person. <laughs> like my car's paid off. I'm totally happy not to have a car payment and no, I'm not rich. You know, I don't live in a huge house. Um, and you know, I'm a single mom with an old car and I don't have a lot of money. I was in an interracial marriage, you know, that people, not everybody, you know, loves. And, um, so what started to happen was the custodian started to come and talk to me and ask me for advice. And all of a sudden, when I became a normal person to them, you know, not somebody who was like driving a whatever you want to call it. Um, it was really interesting. The I've had built these relationships with people who never have had a relationship with somebody in like with my title, you know, and now they'll come to me for advice or guidance or, hey, I'm thinking about bidding on this job. And it's so funny that that never would have happened if they would have never seen me like driving my car into work <laughs> and something that simple. but. It really, it made me laugh, but I couldn't do that to them because I knew to them it was serious. Like people in your job drive Mercedes and lives in mansions. And I was like, no, not even close. If you see me on the weekend, I'm literally in a t-shirt and sweatpants and like playing with my granddaughter. I'm just a regular human being. So um, I think those biases, um, I mean, I can talk about the things, men, women biases and all those things. But for me, that was one that was special to me. Um, that there was this assumption made, um, maybe because of my race, maybe because of the job I held, whatever that is, that I was one thing and I wasn't. And how about being in the such a male dominated environment in politics? Ooh. Like, have you had experiences where, you know, that has impacted you or where, uh, you know, you had to address it? Um, absolutely. It just happened to me the other day. Um, I was in a meeting and I'm typically the only woman in, in the room it, at my level. I'm the only woman. And, um, I, I said something in response to a question and then the guy next to me said it again. And they, they were like, Oh, Tim, great idea. And I sat there for a minute and I waited to see if anybody else in the room would acknowledge that I had literally just said the same thing. And I said, do I want to pick this up or not? Do I want to do something? And I thought I have to, because if nobody else is going to, they're never going to do it for another woman either. So I just said, hey, um, I'm not sure if you heard me. Maybe y'all didn't hear me. Or an email comes out where 
I say something, somebody on top of it responds and says something, and then they give credit to the other person. And I'll just respond and say, thank you for the credit, appreciate it. Not to be a jerk, not to be snarky, but to remind people who don't see it, what they're doing. Um, but I also have to be, you know, an advocate and an ally when I'm in the room with other women to say, wait a minute, I think, I think Sally had something that she wanted to say. Can we give her a second to talk? Um, I have to be that person. And we all as women have to be that person. We have to be those people that give other people because um, being in a male dominated, you know, like career and it's, it's tough. And a lot of us are there. Um, and whether it's jealousy, whether it's um, insecurity on their part, whatever it is, it's not your issue, but you need to advocate for yourself and you need to make sure people see you and bring the other women along with you and make sure they're seen as well. Absolutely. How do you manage self-doubt and that imposter syndrome you were referring to before? Um, I have a lot of good friends. I have a husband that I don't know what I did to deserve, who is my absolutely biggest cheerleader. Um, and I have myself and I have learned how dangerous my self-talk can be, how much I can hurt myself in my own brain with my own self-talk. And um, this sounds so simple and we've all seen the memes on like social media, but being kind to yourself. Like I have that written down at my desk, be kind to yourself, Beth, be kind to yourself um, because I'm not. The first thing I look at right now is I see my double chin, I see this, I see that. And I'm not even thinking about actually, maybe hopefully I'm helping somebody, you know, and I have to be kind to myself. So I think that um, number one, don't look at the comments in social media if you're ever there, just don't look because people are jerks um, and you'll never get the, the, the words out of your head. Secondly, hear the good things, hear the good things people say about you. And third is if you have to write yourself a note, a post-it, whatever it is, be kind to yourself, use kind words about yourself. Um, otherwise you're never gonna get out of that doubtful place and you're just gonna continue to hurt yourself and you won't say yes. And if I hadn't say, said yes, even though I was insecure, even though I felt like every day I would look at the door, like, is my name still on the door on that sign? You know, like I, I was nervous. I still went in every day, put on my big girl shoes and my big girl pants and went to work. So um, be kind to yourself is the best advice I can give anybody. Absolutely. And, you know, I, I'm reminded of something you mentioned to me the other day, that post-it that you have on your computer. Talk to us about that. I don't know if you guys can see it. Probably no. It is, oh, there it is. Sorry, <laughs> with the crossed out. I'll never forget that. So, um, a boss that I had, he uh, decided that he needed to give me some feedback about myself, and so you know, I, I decided to listen and take the pieces that were helpful. And one of the things that he said stuck with me, which is, I apologize too much, and I apologize for things that I don't do. Sometimes I think I apologize just for existing in the space that I'm in. And so on my desk and on my laptop, I keep this post-it that says, sorry, with a line through it, like the cigarettes, you know, like the cigarette line, um, when you don't, when there's no smoking. Um, and when I go to say it, I'm so sorry. I'm sorry. I didn't mean, I, I can stop myself. It's just my little reminder to stop apologizing unless I actually hurt somebody, unless I actually did something wrong um, and stop apologizing just for being Beth Christian, so just true. for being me. So true. And the reframing, right? Going into meetings and reframing conversations instead of apologizing for things that are out of our control. Yeah. Instead Thank of saying being late, I'm so sorry I'm late. Thank you for waiting for me. I really appreciate that you waited for me to, to start the meeting. Like right. it's, it's that's it's that self-talk and it's telling yourself it's okay. Right. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, Christina, uh, yes. what would you tell women who are starting out in their careers? What would you like them to know? I would like them to actually apply for that position, even if they don't feel like they're fully qualified, even if they feel like they don't meet all of the criteria on the, um, you know, prerequisites, just try it, try it out. The worst thing that they could tell you is no. Um, and then if you want to open your own business, go ahead and don't do it on a small scale. I, you know, I always joke about it, but I tell myself, you know, when a man decides to open a restaurant, he's not going to open that restaurant in his basement. 
He's going to go and he's going to sign a lease and he's going to get a loan and he's going to get the equipment and he's going to open himself a business in a commercial space. Women, they I feel like they want to play small or they want to play conservative or they don't want to take too much risk. But if you don't play bigger, you're never going to be able to be as successful. I really believe it. So you're just as worthy of signing a lease. You're just as worthy of, you know, and don't be scared of a little bit of debt. It's okay. If the debt is going to bring you more in the end, it's worth it. OK, you have to see it as a temporary investment. Oh, you know, but I've saved all this money and I don't want to put it into this business. Well, put it into that business and then make sure that you're going to get that tenfold. And I think that it's also very important, I think, and this is something that my sisters taught me, but it's it's OK for women to talk about money. And it's OK for that because most women don't. And most women don't have those financial conversations. They have more of the emotional, softer, you know, less. But it's, I feel like, you know, when you're young, it's very important for you to feel okay to, you know, say, this is not okay with me, or this is not what I'm expecting, or this is not what I'm worth, or this is not what I believe. And to actually go and ask for what you're worth apply to where you actually want to work and maybe if that position is not available they might really like you and they might offer you another position they might have you work on something else and it might be the best opportunity you've ever had in your life but you're not going to know unless you try okay and my advice is you're never going to be ready enough i'm i'm not ready enough even today <laughs> and i'm sure beth agrees like i'm sure you've done things and you've said I don't know if I can, I don't know if I'm ready and you're probably not ready and that's fine. But you will get ready along the way and you will fine tune along the way and your formula will not be perfect from the beginning. And that's okay. And you that know? is so true. That is so yeah. true. Yeah. I had thought about starting my business for 10 years before I actually took the leap. And, you know, some days I wake up and I pinch myself and I'm like, I really did it. I really did it. And you should just go for it. My advice to everyone is, also go for it take yeah. that risk and if it's a leadership role and you think you're not ready you know what's gonna make you more ready yeah. you know ask the questions is it a course is it a it's not it's it's usually yourself holding you back just take that risk and go for it right um it's it's you'll believe in yourself more and more and you'll build confidence as you see success is my belief and that's another really good point. Like, you know, sorry, Linda, to just add to that, like, you're always saying, you know, we're always taking professional development seminars, and we're always like, like trying to better ourselves in our work. But how about just development seminars for ourselves as a human? You know, whether it's what Beth is saying, to be more assertive, to stop saying sorry. That's a lesson I learned a very long time ago from a coach. Stop apologizing. You're going to realize that you should only be apologizing 10% of the time that you're actually apologizing. And if you just change your speech, the way of saying it, it's going to be, first of all, you're going to be very respected and it's going to be perceived even better because you're going to seem confident. The flip side is that when you're actually wrong, you have to admit it. I really believe that. Okay. When you actually made a mistake and you're actually wrong and you're, it's actually your fault. You have to be okay with saying, I know that I did this. I take full responsibility for this, not try to brush it off on other people. This is what I learned from it. This is how I can change. And here's what I'm going to do to, you know, for my behavior to be altered in the future. And I think that you're just going to benefit from that. So how do you manage self-doubt, Christina? I, I basically tell myself that I can. I tell myself that, you know, I, I also don't compare myself very much. My biggest competition is myself. Okay, so I basically tell myself, well, why should you doubt? And if you're doubting, well, why are you doubting? And the aspect that you're doubting yourself on, figure it out. Like I said, whether it's take a course, whether it's, you know, on your parenting skills or on your leadership skills within your business or within your relationship, you're not going to be perfect, but you can always make it better and you can always be at a better place. 
So how I manage doubting myself is why am I doubting myself? And if I have that doubt, well, how could I fix it so that I don't doubt myself? And of course, you're always going to doubt yourself to a certain level, but it's always going to be less and less and less. And it's always going to be in a different area if you're actually working on yourself. But working on yourself, I understand who has time for that. You have to make time for that. It's extremely important to work on yourself because you're never going to be your best self if you're just say, oh, well, this is who I am. Okay, but this is who I am is, you know, I'm sure Beth is not who she was when she started her career. <laughs> and you can't just be content with who you were at that time. You always have to try to improve. That's how I, I feel. A question for you from Laura from Edmonton. To you, Christina, she says, yeah. how do you sell yourself as qualified when you are missing experience and qualifications? How do we shift it? I think it's by first, you have to try to make the person feel confident in your ability, in your interaction with them and have them feel like they matter. OK, so for me, a big thing is and, you know, one thing is if you don't feel qualified, you probably shouldn't go ahead. That's my opinion. So if you feel like this is not something that you can do and that you can do well, you maybe shouldn't be learning on this client. Okay, that's number one. But if you do decide to go ahead and you do feel like, you know, you may not be fully qualified, but you could learn from it or you could learn as you go along. I think that you have to make the person feel like they're not just another number. Like I deal with a lot of estates. I settle, you know, when someone passes away, I transfer properties, multiple properties per week. If I made everyone in my office feel like they're just another one of my property transfers, it wouldn't make them feel special. OK, so I think it's, you know, understanding that this is the situation that the person is faced with in that one particular instance. And they probably haven't dealt with the passing of a spouse, the passing of a parent, the passing of a you know, of a sibling and just making them feel like they're important and making them feel like the job is important to you and that you're doing it well, will just give you credibility as you go along with them. Very good. And um, back to Beth, what energizes you about your work? That's one question I hadn't asked you. Sure. So, um, a lot of times people ask me this when I'm interviewing them, like, what do you love about your job? What makes you stay? And there, there's a lot of things, but one of them is um, what my agency does is we take care of all of the things that allow the other agencies to take care of the people. So we make sure they have the buildings, the the stuff, the, you know, we procure the stuff, we make sure they have the buildings, we make sure we have whatever. And that way they can serve their clients and serve the citizens. But I think one of the things that's really cool, and this isn't because it's um, braggy, it's, it's, I can watch the news at night and inevitably every night there's something that I've touched, some project, some work that I've touched. And I'm like, look at that. That's like, that's something huge. This is something big. This is gonna help people. And, um, or when one of my ideas, you know, one of my, my team takes a little idea that I have and turns it into something amazing. Like I am hyped, I'm ready to go, you know? And I think that um, the last thing is just really, when I, I'm always moving forward and I'm always thinking in the clouds. Um, but when I finally learned to keep a hand back to bring people with me, that energizes me as I see other people grow because I've brought them along or I've said their name in rooms where it might not have been said. Um, and then I watch them and like, so-and-so just got promoted. And not taking credit, I just give myself like a little, yeah, like if I had a little baby piece of that, I am so psyched and it makes me want to do it more. Amazing. And what mistakes have you made along the way and what did you learn from them? Oh, goodness, a ton. Um, one is uh, trying to fill space. Um, I have another post-it on my laptop that says, wait, why am I talking? not so that I talk less, you know, because I'm a woman or anything like that, but because just because it's quiet doesn't mean I need to talk to fill the space. I should be listening more and talking less, um, especially in the, in the role that I like hold. So some of my mistakes have just been talking too much and not asking questions. Um, another big mistake is I, I wasn't curious when someone would bring me a problem. 
I would immediately try to fix it. But I was never curious. I didn't ask them curious questions to try to understand what it was. And I think being curious is so healthy. Um, and that was something that I learned, you know, incredibly, it was a great lesson, an incredible lesson. Um, and last, this is the other big one. Do you need my help or do you need to vent? Linda, you want to talk to me, but 90% of the time, you don't want me to solve your problem. You just want me to listen. And I'm right. a dealer, man. I want to, I want to go and I want to fix your problem. And the best lesson I've learned is to say, is to ask that question. What do you need? Do you need me to listen, which is totally okay? Or do you need me to help you? And boy, has that changed the trajectory of the conversations that I have, asking curious questions, asking what they actually need from me. Um, so I tell you those, those solutions because those are all of the mistakes that I made, like hearing somebody and starting to fix a problem that they didn't even ever want me to fix. Um, and, and learning from those things where I really made things worse for the employee instead of just listening. Mm -hmm. What tips would you like to share on how to build a strong team and keep employees engaged? Me? Mm -hmm. Um, I think for one, um, I think it all, well, number one, I think it all starts in your hiring. Um, I would much rather hire a person who is eager, who is excited, who wants to come work with me than a person that checks every box on that, on that app, that, like the job description and knows how to do everything. I can teach them. I can't teach them to want to. So first off for me, it's bringing people on that are just as excited as I am and just as eager to do a great job. Um, it's also seeing in people sort of what, I, what other people saw in me, which was I had some marks against me that didn't make my life as easier. You know, I might've had to take off work more because I had, a, you know, I was a single mom or whatever. Seeing that in people and knowing that it makes them work twice as hard. And then when I have all the team together, it's really creating a community where, you know, there's times where we just do things that are fun together. There's times that, um, we share our stories where we, you know, we may not work seven, eight, eight hours a day. You know, we may take a half an hour where we're just talking or we're laughing or we're playing a game or we're going out for happy hour. Um, but the community is what makes the team want to work harder um, and right. make loyal to each other and they don't want to stay. So it's not just about loyalty to me. It's about, um, do they feel safe? Do they feel like they're a part of the community? Do they mm -hmm. feel like they can tell other people what's going on in their life? All of the rest of it will, will fall into place. I promise. Um, I can teach you almost anything that you could do in my area, but I can't teach you to want to. For me, that is the best team that I can build. Right. We have a question from uh, one of our uh, Will community uh, participants. Um, I'll start with you, but then I'll ask the question to Christina as well. We have Vanessa. Vanessa is asking, what is one tool from your toolbox both of you can share when faced with diversity in the workplace, mostly for being a woman in a leadership role, which is normally seen as a male dominated role? Well, first off, hi, Vanessa, because Vanessa is my mentee, so I adore her. Um, <laughs> I think if, if, it's, if it's my Vanessa, yes. Um, so I'll answer your question. Um, I think that, so what I used to do was I would wear black and gray suits every single day. So I looked like the people in the room. I would wear my hair up. Um, I would never wear color. Um, first off, stop doing all of that. You're a woman, you're not gonna change it. Um, but come in, do it having done your research, having done whatever you can do to figure out what that topic is about and be ready for it and come in the room and just speak confidently about it. Don't um, don't say, well, maybe speak like you know what you're talking about. And if your ideas don't get picked up, don't get disappointed, that's all right. It's all about the, 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 the way you present it. And um, I find that, you know, sometimes you can go off the cuff, but other times it's really smart to just do a little bit of research about the topic. And all of a sudden you're bringing something to the table that nobody else is bringing because they didn't think to. Right. So Christina, we'll go to you with the same question. What is one tool from your toolbox that you can share when faced with diversity in the workplace, mostly for being a woman in a leadership role, which is normally seen as a male dominant role? 
So I think it's kind of in line with what Beth had to say, but I think it's coupling competence with authenticity. Okay. I think that if you're competent and you know what you're doing and you could make the person feel secure that you do possess the knowledge required to help them with the mandate at hand. Okay. That's number one. And number two is to actually be authentic. And, you know, as women, that's one thing. I think that that's an edge that we have that we're able to empathize a little bit more that we're able to understand a little bit more on a little bit of a different level so if you're super competent super intelligent super qualified in what you're doing and you could understand the human behind the question that you're being asked I think that just there you have like a killer combination to actually like make the person believe that you're the right person to get the job done Great. Mm -hmm. So Christina and Beth, we are coming to the end of our session. I'm going to ask the participants to ask any questions they may have. Um, we have just a couple of minutes left. We have about seven, eight minutes left. Uh, Christina, is there anything you'd like to share? Some last words you'd like to share with, uh, you know, young women who are looking to either start a business, become a leader, um, or, you know, go for that new job or make a career transition. What's your advice? I think that it's very important for them to be well-rounded. And I think that it's very easy when you're young to get very consumed by doing well in your career. But I think that you have to do well in many different aspects, whether that be, you know, working on your personal relationships, working on your friendship, working on your, say, romantic relationship, just putting in the work that's required to actually be a balanced person, because it's unrealistic for you to think that you're going to do really well in your career and everything else is going to fall into place. It's just not. And of course, you're going to have to make certain compromises. And of course, you're going to have to, you know, sometimes choose a work event over, you know, a dinner with your spouse, but that's okay. But you have to find uh, a normal that's, you know, okay that you're okay with and then maybe traditionally is very different from what you grew up in or what you had before or what your parents were used to you know because as women are you know working more be are in different management positions are you know advancing in their careers faster than ever before a lot of industries are female dominated now I just think that it's really shifted and it's okay if you can't have the exact same family life dynamic that your parents had because times are very different okay and one other thing that I think is very very important and for me it's very central in my life is to embrace philanthropy Okay, to in, get involved in something. You can't just be good in your work. You have to, you know, I work with um, the Alzheimer's Society of Canada. I deal with caregivers, people that are faced with the illness, uh, you know, the family members. I deal with the organization. I see what legislative changes could be made so that, you know, we're better equipped to face the fact that a lot more people are gonna have a neurological disorder by 2050. Um, I work with the Montreal Children's Hospital. My daughter having had cancer, it's something that's extremely important to me. I do fundraising initiatives all year for the children. I go to the hospital, I'll help out. I do events that put a smile on the children's faces. So for me, it's not just being really good at what I do and being a really good notary. If I can't be a good mom, if I can't be a good friend, if I can't be a good partner, if I can't give back, if I can't share my knowledge in many different ways that may not bring me back dollars. And that's okay. It doesn't have to, you know, I once gave a conference and they asked me like, how much does this cost? Like, how much is it for you to come give this conference? And I'm like, it's free. It is my absolute pleasure to share my knowledge. And it brings you back tenfold. Believe me, I promise you, whether it be in referrals, whether it be in connections, whether it be in expanding your network, whether it be in another opportunity that arose from having said yes to that. Um, you know, I think that it's really, really important for you to just be well-rounded and not only focus on your career. Yes, it's central. Yes, it's what's going to probably feed your family. But if you don't work on all of the other aspects in your life, I do believe that you're not going to reach your full potential. Thank you so much, Christina. Mm -hmm. Beth, 
same question for you. Is there anything else you'd like to share for women starting out in their career, transitioning, looking up to you for the leadership advice? What would you like to share? First off, it's okay to make mistakes. It's going to seem like this mistake is going to be with you forever. I promise in a week, in a couple of days, that mistake will pass and something else will come up and just learn from it. Learn from your mistakes. Um, they're the best lessons you will ever learn. You won't forget them in the sense that, okay, I know what I need to do differently. Um, stay true to yourself. Um, you know, I agree completely with Christina. My job became who I was. My job became central to who I was. And when I got remarried, I realized that I was so much more and I had to remember that I was so much more. Um, I'm a giver. I, I love people. I love animals. I love all kinds of things. How do I, how do I find a way to do both? Um, and find a place to work that embraces your passion, your strength, your true self. Don't stay somewhere out of fear. Um, that's one of the best pieces of advice I can give. You're never going to be your total self. You're never going to be your best self if you stay anywhere out of fear. And my last one is something I tell everybody, and Vanessa has heard me say this, say yes. Say yes to every opportunity. Don't say, oh, well, that's not really my job. Say yes. Best thing you can do is put it on your resume and you got to do it. Right. But just say yes. Say yes to engagements like this that make me nervous, but I still do them because I want to share what I know. Um, so, you know, if you want your own post it, write say yes and put it on your computer and remind yourself to say yes when opportunities come. Um, right. And then have people hold you accountable. Have your friends or your mentors check in with you and say, did you say yes? <laughs> Did you say yes to that? So um, those are my those are my tips, my takeaways. We have Thank one so last we have one last question. Um, uh, yes, an anonymous question. Um, if if the the question is, has anybody experienced bullying from their boss, and how did they overcome that? I can take that one first. Um, Yes. Um, I actually worked in a place that I loved and my boss moved on to a better uh, opportunity and I got a new boss and, um, it was a, actually a woman and, um, she was an African-American woman and I have mixed, I have biracial kids. And so, um, you know, I did my best to try to impress her, to have her back, to give her what she needed. And I never see, she never seemed to be able to get past the fact that I um, was married to someone who was the same race as her. So she began to, she withhold, she withheld a promotion that I was supposed to be getting. She um, kept me six months when I tried to leave her. She held me six months until I could move on to my next job. Um, and eventually, do you know what I did? I just realized that this woman literally is just a human being who is absolutely miserable. And I am going to knock this out because eventually I will be away from her and it's going to be okay. But I actively sought another job. Like I, in all of my time, I was willing to take a demotion, a lateral, because I knew that the thing was never going to be healthy. Um, but I also realized that she didn't even know me. She made a decision that she didn't like me based on something that wasn't anything to do with work. And um, I was never going to let her um, change who I was, the loving person that I am. And so I got through it. You know, I had lots of snarky conversations with my mentors that I can't repeat in this mixed company. Um, I got it out of my system, the anger and the frustration. So it never came out towards my employees, but I left the situation. It was the best possible thing I could have done. Glad to hear that you prioritized your, your mental health. And uh, yeah, for sure. Super important. So we are at uh, the end of our session. It's 1 p.m. I would just like to say thank you so much, Christina and Beth. It's been an amazing uh, experience to have you as our panelists. We are honored that you took the time and spent it with us and shared your whole journey with us. We are so excited to have you, hopefully another time. Um, so we would like to share that you can uh, visit our website, womeninleadership.ca to subscribe to our newsletter. If you'd like, this will be recorded. This session will be recorded and posted as well at a later date. 
And uh, thank you so much. Thank you for, uh, for attending our session and uh, keep, uh, keep watch for our next uh, events. We have two events coming up. If you could go back one slide, the next one will be on March 1st, uh, Harnessing the Power of Your Personal Brand by Jake Carls, who's uh, a co-founder at Midday Squares. I'm a huge fan of his, by the way, and Midday Squares. So stay tuned. I'm going to be, I've registered myself for that as well. And then on uh, March 8th, we have International Women's Day, uh, which we will be having a session called Leading with Vulnerability and Authenticity, hosted by the Alberta chapter. The uh, Midday Squares event is hosted by Ottawa. I forgot to mention that. But go ahead, go on our website. You can uh, register for these events. They're all free. And uh, we can't wait to see you in future. Take good care. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye.